Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Puyat, for that uh, introduction. And uh, I thank the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, allow me to share with you um, some of the research that we've been doing uh, on the topic of yoga for mental health and well being. I want to start um, by really sort of defining what we mean by yoga. And this is what we mean when we're talking about yoga that's um, used by researchers. Um, of course, the postures and exercises you hear are, uh, you know, what yoga is most known for and what it's visible for. Uh, and there are a lot of people who practice nothing but the postures and exercises. But uh, traditionally, yoga is a multi-component practice that includes not just the postures and exercises, but very importantly, also the breathing techniques, deep relaxation, and very importantly, a meditative component. So when I use the word yoga for the purposes of um, today's seminar, I'm really referring to this um, full and complete multi-component traditional practice of yoga. Now, the psychophysiology of yoga, the basic research has been growing dramatically over the past um, multiple decades, especially over the past two decades. Um, and with any growth in the field of uh, research, uh, we start to see review papers summarizing um, the kinds of um, results that have come from a lot of the basic research that's been conducted. And this is just an example of a number of review papers uh, recently published. Uh, this one on how yoga reduces stress, this one on yoga for immune system functioning, this one on neurocognitive mechanisms, this one on stress again, and this one on self-regulatory mechanisms uh, for psychological health. And um, this information is, is also um, covered in uh, our textbook, The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare in Chapter 4, in which we also uh, review the psychophysiology uh, of yoga practices. Now, going back historically to see where some of the genesis of this research was, some of the early research was done in India, and the research was really along the lines of studying these advanced practitioners or yoga masters. Um, this, is, uh, this slide shows uh, you know, a photograph from a study of you know, probably the leading of its kind. This team of researchers traveled all over India for a year, hunting down these uh, advanced practitioners, hooking them up to the recording equipment you see here. And the conclusion from that long study was that physiologically yogic meditation represents deep relaxation of the autonomic nervous system. And there's two important points to note from this conclusion. Number one is the old idea of relaxation of a system that was believed to be automatic. I mean, it was called the autonomic nervous system because it was believed to be uh, not under your control or influence. So this introduces a central construct in the field, not just of yoga, but in the entire field of what we call mind-body medicine. The idea of self-regulation of internal state, both physiological and psychological. In other words, through these training practices, individuals are able to exert uh, influence on their internal functioning. The other important feature of this statement is refer reference to the autonomic nervous system. And this applies also to the other system that's involved in mediating stress responses, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, suggesting that um, these yoga practitioners have particular influence over stress uh, responsivity, stress reactivity. Now, another feature of yoga, of course, is the physical postures and exercises. And um, through a lot of very objective research, which is measuring sort of flexibility, angles, range, ranges of motion, we have very strong evidence that people that engage in a practice of yoga, which involves a lot of stretching type postures, uh, doesn't uh, yield improvements in things like oxygen uptake, flexibility, muscular endurance, and muscle strength. It very clearly has a, has a strong impact. And it's very different than, than Western type aerobic exercises, where, which are not as focused on balance and flexibility um, and um, uh, isometrics um, as yoga is. And yoga tends to be, uh, the postures and exercises tend to be more conducive to uh, a relaxation effect. Now, um, as I mentioned, one of the key findings in the, um, uh, in, in the studies that have been done is this modulation of stress. And a good body of research has really demonstrated pretty convincingly that yoga is very good at reducing stress. Um, and this is one example of this. Um, this is a study that was done um, uh, looking at the physical relaxation component, um, uh, which is manifested in Western um, uh, clinical uh, 
venues as progressive muscle relaxation. In yoga, it's called corpse pose or shavasana, typically done at the end of a yoga class. And relaxation is an important component of yoga practice. In this study, they applied progressive relaxation in a randomized control trial and showed that uh, in the black bar, the relaxation group was able to re uh, reduce perceived stress. They were able to, uh, to reduce state, uh, state trait anxiety. They were able to increase uh, self-reported relaxation, and they were also able to uh, objectively reduce their heart rate measure as compared to a control group that did not do the relaxation practice. They also looked at the objective measure of salivary cortisol and showed that over a, um, a yoga practice, they could reduce um, uh, salivary cortisol with progressive relaxation, uh, and a control group had no change. Now, the other thing that, that we're seeing also is um, the breathing practices in traditional yoga. And these um, are starting to be shown to have significant impact, both psychologically and physiologically. Um, and this um, particular uh, study looks at um, slow breathing. This is the most common form of breathing practice in yoga. And what, what's being shown here is the effect directly on the autonomic nervous system, specifically manifested as systolic blood pressure. So what you can see, as soon as the uh, subjects engaged in slow abdominal breathing, systolic blood pressure drops uh, significantly and then returns to normal after the practice. Um, this influence on the autonomic nervous system also extends to the stress response. Uh, so in this study, they did um, uh, uh, an experiment in which the, uh, both groups in this randomized control trial were subjected to a stressor. Um, and what you can see in the control group that didn't do any practice, uh, there's a su significant increase in stress. The control group did a yoga practice, and you can see that the stress uh, response is substantially attenuated. Uh, suggesting that yoga has modulated the stress response significantly. Other effects of slow breathing are starting to be shown to show significant benefit in things like respiratory efficiency um, and even uh, effects on the central nervous system in emotion regulation and in pain regulation significantly. Now just jump, jumping forward to modern technology, perhaps uh, the most powerful technique that's being used in contemplative practices research is so-called neuroimaging. And what's pictured here uh, is the fMRI, which is capable of looking precisely within the central nervous system at individual nuclei. Uh, and it can observe the changes in those nuclei from second to second. Um, and some of you may know uh, Richie Davidson, who's a leader uh, in the field of meditation research in this, in this photograph. One of the kinds of research that's been done with neuroimaging is to ask the question, uh, do the brains of meditators uh, have different types of activity um, than do non-meditators? And there have been a number of studies that have looked at this uh, question, and this is one of those studies. And indeed, they did find differences between meditators and non-meditators. They found that cerebral blood flow of the long-term meditators was significantly higher compared to non-meditators in regions of the prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, thalamus, butamen, caudate, and midbrain. The observed changes appear in structures that underlie the attention network and also those that relate to emotion and autonomic function. So this fits well with what we see behaviorally, this, these improvements in emotion and autonomic function, uh, which are well known with, with yoga practice. And the engagement of the attention networks, the improvement in those uh, networks is because of the meditative component. As you meditate, you focus your attention, and when you do that, you engage the attention networks, and over time, the attention networks become more efficient uh, and, and change in structure uh, and activity. We also see changes in biochemistry. Uh, this is work done by Chris Streeter at Boston University in which uh, she's looking at an fMRI technique that's capable of imaging levels of the neurotransmitter GABA a well-known inhibitory neurotransmitter throughout the central nervous system that's been strongly associated with mood state. And what she's shown in her line of studies is that after a single yoga class, imaging uh, the participants before and after a single yoga class, she was able to demonstrate uh, significant increases in the levels of the GABA neurotransmitter, which are tightly correlated with the improvements in mood state. So, what these imaging data are telling us, not only can we change brain activity, uh, we can change brain biochemistry with these practices. 
And as probably most of you know, the central nervous system has a feature known as neuroplasticity. It adapts its structure to accommodate behavioral changes over time. And um, so obviously yoga is a behavioral practice that many people do for long periods of time. So the question has been asked, are there changes in brain structure with practice over time? So this slide shows um, figures from a study that was conducted at our National Institutes of Health uh, in the US on long-term yoga practitioners uh, and, and compared results from their um, data to those of non-yoga practitioners. And what they were looking at in this study uh, was tolerance to pain, specifically cold pain tolerance. And the yoga practitioners are located here in the black dots and the uh, non-practitioners in the open circles. And what you can see is in terms of cold pain tolerance, the yoga practitioners are really clustered at the higher end of cold pain tolerance, whereas the non-yoga practitioners are really clustered at the lower end of cold pain tolerance. The other th thing they did simultaneously was to image the region of the brain involved in pain regulation, the insula, and calculate the volume of the gray matter volume in that region of the brain. And what they found was that on average, the um, long-term practitioners are clustered at the higher end of gray matter volume, whereas the non-practitioners are um, seeing lower uh, volumes of gray matter in that region of the brain, suggesting that, that there's something about yoga practice that has uh, engendered this change in brain structure. And that's sort of reaffirmed to some degree by this plot here, which looks at the duration of yoga practice of all the yoga practitioners in the study. And what you can see is a significant relationship such that the longer that individuals had been practicing yoga, the larger that region of the brain was. So overall, again, these studies are telling us that um, not only are we changing brain activity, we're changing brain biochemistry, we're changing brain structure. And the beauty of these studies, of course, is that they're very objective measures. Um, so this now puts us on a footing that that sort of uh, sort of gets gets rid of the argument that yoga is just sort of a placebo effect. It's not just our imagination. These changes that we're seeing in in activity and biochemistry and structure are clinically significant, as clinically significant as you can get with any kind of pharmaceutical. So this is really putting. Um, this basic research on, on a solid footing with respect to its relevance uh, to changes in internal state. Now, meditation is largely engaging the focus of attention, and different styles of meditation really differ into what the focus of attention is. But when one starts to meditate, what happens after a very short period of time for virtually everyone that meditates, regardless of their experience in meditation, is that they slip into mind wandering. Uh, and then they'll be in that state for a while. They'll notice that their mind is now wandering and no longer focusing on the target of attention. So, the, so then the job in meditation is to bring your attention back. So meditation practice in the real world is actually a cycle. It's a cycle of meditation focus on a target and then an interruption with mind wandering and then a reorientation back to the target. So that's what uh, meditation really is in the real world. So if, if, if scientists, if we really want to study meditation, it really makes sense to study the full practice the way it's actually appearing. And that includes not just the focus phase of meditation, but also the mind wandering phase. And that's what actually has been done in this particular study um, that was done um, by a Harvard research team and published, of course, in our premier biomedical journal, Science. They studied mind wandering uh, in the general population. And what they found was that people's minds wandered frequently, regardless of what they were doing. Now, of course, that's, that's obvious. That's well known. Everyone knows that when you're sitting at the, in the doctor's office or at a bus stop, you're, you know, your mind is wandering from, from topic to topic. The interesting finding in the study was that people were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they're not, leading to the conclusion that the ability to think about what is not happening, in other words, mind wandering about the future or the past, is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. Now, it's interesting to try and understand what the emotional cost might be coming from. Now, mind wandering is actually a survival feature. It allows us to analyze the past and predict the future which gives us a leg up in terms of survival. Now, what we're thinking about most, of course, is actually survival issues. So every time you have a thought come in <clears throat> that interrupts your meditation, you're thinking about survival, perhaps. 
Um, these are stressful thoughts because in survival issues, there's no certainty of your survival. So every time you have a stressful thought, you have a little bit of a mini stress response, a mini emotional reaction. If that starts to develop and, and grow into rumination, uh, you can develop into a mood disturbance, and over time, that can be a risk factor for developing a mental health condition like depression or anxiety. So what happens when you focus your attention in meditation? Well, mind wandering ceases because the attention networks can only focus on one thing at a time. So at least for the amount of time that you're successfully holding that focus, it's kind of like a holiday from the negative uh, content of mind wandering. But I think what's more significant than that is that you are developing a skill of self-regulation of your attention networks. That means that you start to develop some degree of self-regulation over your own thought processes. And ultimately that over time with months of practice leads into a state of metacognition, um, which means that you are no longer under sort of domination by your thoughts, you have some degree of self-regulation. Um, and significantly, metacognition is the underlying principle of perhaps the most popular and universally used form of psychotherapy today, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the idea that you are not your thoughts and therefore that you have the ability to change your reactivity to those thoughts and perhaps even if you want to change the content of those thoughts. So meditation really shares metacognition with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now we can actually see this process in the scanner. Uh, this was a study done with meditators in the scanner who were asked to do the meditation task. And, noticed, and when they noticed that their minds had slipped into wandering, they were given an event marker. So now the researchers were able to show images of brain activity during the focus phase of meditation when people were successfully holding their focus and during the mind wandering phase when their minds were wandering. And what we see are very different patterns of uh, activity. Uh, during the focus phase, what's being engaged is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is in the frontal lobes in the executive regions of the brain where the attention networks are. And of course, that makes sense because you're engaging the attention networks. However, when the uh, mind is wandering, it's a much more diffuse collection of brain regions that's being activated. And this is known as the default mode network. And we're now starting to understand the neurophysiology and the neuroscience consequences of spending more time in the, in the focus phase and more time in the mind wandering phase. Uh, we know that long-term meditators um, actually have less emotional reactivity. In fact, what we see is structural changes in the amygdala within the limbic system, the emotional brain, such that the amygdala is actually is smaller because they've become less emotionally and stress reactive. We are also starting to see the relationship between these different brain regions. We know, for example, that there are inhibitory connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. So that the more time you spend in the prefrontal cortex, the more you are quieting down uh, limbic stress and emotional activity. We're also seeing that people that spend excessive amounts of time mind wandering in the default mode network and going into rumination are much more at risk for the development of mood disorders, whereas meditators are in fact much much more immune to immune dis, uh, to uh, emotion disorders. In fact, um, uh, many studies are now showing that meditation has a good deal of efficacy for mental health conditions. And we can see this uh, in a number of imaging studies. So this basic premise of activation of the prefrontal cortex, uh, inhibiting these primate, uh, primal regions of the brain uh, where the stress and emotion responses take place. Now, um, the whole idea of stress regulation is actually um, well-researched. It's, it's one of the findings that's really consistent. I mean, virtually every study that has looked at um, stress outcomes from a yoga intervention has shown positive improvements. Uh, and there are a few reviews that, that have um, verified this. Um, this study shows, in fact, that um, most types of yoga have positive effects on stress reduction in healthy populations. Now, many studies that have been done on stress have been done with subjective measures, typically things like the perceived stress scale. However, a number of studies have also been done with objective measures. So this review looks specifically at that, showing that there are changes indeed in objective measures such as uh, the stress hormone cortisol, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, uh, fre high frequency heart rate variability, uh, blood glucose, and blood lipids, uh, all indicating improved regulation of the sympathetic nervous system 
and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. And just to give you an example from our research, uh, we've conducted um, research on yoga in workplace populations, particularly professionals who are under high stress occupations. This was a study that we did um, with education professionals, teachers uh, mostly, uh, and showed that after a six week intervention of a Kripalu yoga practice, uh, we were able to reduce the um, levels of perceived stress at, at the post-treatment uh, at the end of the six-week program and statistically significantly at the long-term follow-up, whereas the control group had no change over time. In terms of resilience, uh, we also see improvements uh, slowly increasing, although these did not reach statistical significance by the long-term follow-up, but there was certainly no change uh, in the control condition. Now another feature that comes about when practicing yoga, particularly the meditative component, is that as you practice meditation, you start to increase your mind-body awareness, which is also known as mindfulness. And we now have fairly convincing evidence that these meditative practices within yoga are increasing mindfulness. This is a cross-sectional study of long-term uh, yoga practitioners done in Germany. And they divided these practitioners and into the frequency of their um, yoga practice and divided them up into those that were practicing marginally, those that were practicing at a moderate level, and those that were practicing at a high level in terms of frequency and intensity of practice. And what you can see is really a dose-response relationship uh, such that the more intense and the more frequent they were practicing, uh, the higher their scores on mindfulness were. Those that were practicing marginally were uh, really no different from controls that did not practice yoga. Uh, so this is in long-term practitioners, but we even see these changes over the short term. So this is that same study with education professionals, and we were able to show improvements, statistically significant increases in scores on um, the five-facet mindfulness questionnaire at the end of the six-week program and at the two-month follow-up, whereas a control group that did not practice the yoga had no change over time. Now, we also see temporal changes uh, in yoga practice. And I mean, over the short term, we see this arousal reduction, the down regulation of the stress and emotion response systems, uh, which induces a sense of physical and mental well-being. And this has been characterized uh, by Herb Benson, meditation researcher, as the relaxation response. It's essentially the opposite of the fight or flight response. And of course, this is the rationale for why many people want to go to a yoga class to get this sense of physical and mental well-being and relaxation. Now, as people practice over time, what we've seen from the structural um, brain plasticity studies we see and, and, and behavioral studies, we see improvements in skill sets. So people improve their mind-body awareness or mindfulness. They increase their resilience to stress and their self-regulation of their own internal processes, both physi physiological and psychological. And this is why people continue to practice, because they are, they are more empowered to be able to cope with the high level of stress in modern society. And what we see in people who now adopt a much more intensive practice of yoga and go on to practice over the course of, say, months and years of practice in what we might even call a yoga lifestyle, many of these individuals report a psychological or philosophical transformation. People will use the phrase, yoga changed my life. And this is really suggesting a deeper change, something that's changing fundamentally in terms of their perspective on life, their relationship to themselves, their goals, their lives, the, the uh, society around them. And where I believe this comes from is in the meditative practice. And what we know is that meditative practices can induce these unitive states of consciousness. And these unitive states of consciousness, even if they're brief and fleeting, can be very powerful and very transformative in changing one's perspective, uh, perspective on, on, on life. And this essentially leads us into the whole concept of um, what you might say is spirituality, pure spirituality. And this has actually become a field of research. This is a, a, a recent study looking at the relationship between yoga and spirituality. And they concluded that according to the quantitative and qualitative studies, qualitative studies reviewed, Yoga practice seems to be positively associated with spirituality. And we can see this same study that I showed from the German um, uh, researchers on these long-term yoga practitioners. They applied a, a religious and spiritual well-being questionnaire. And on total scores for spiritual well-being, again, you see this dose-response curve, that the higher-level practitioners are experiencing higher scores on spiritual well-being. 
And on subscales of their questionnaire on positive psychological states, including hope, connectedness, and experiences of sense and meaning, again, there's this dose response effect. But we can even see this over the short term. We did a study with young adult musicians uh, showing that yoga can induce the flow state much more uh, than control subjects who were not practicing this. And this is also reflected in the subscale of the autotelic experience, which is that unit of state. So overall, we can take all of this basic research data and come to um, a sort of a logic model. So yoga in, is in its multi-component is all of these four components. Now it's through each of these components individually and all of them together that we can increase changes on the physical level, and I'm calling this fitness. These are objective measures like flexibility, strength, coordination, balance, respiratory function. Also through all four of these practices, either individually or together in multi-component yoga, we're improving self-regulation of internal state, particularly stress and emotion regulation, which leads to the skills of resilience and equanimity in the face of the ups and downs of emotions. It's largely through the meditative component of yoga practice we're seeing this increase in mind-body awareness, also known as mindfulness, by engaging the attention networks, which improves cognition and concentration, and over time leads to this very powerful state of metacognition. And then finally, also th largely through the meditative component, people uh, over a longer term practice achieve these uh, unitive state experiences of transcendence flow, which leads to this deeper transformation and a change in life meaning and purpose. And one thing you can see from this logic model is we're making changes across a broad spectrum of human functioning, all the way from the gross levels of uh, connective tissue and muscle to the deepest experiences that humans can have. Um, and that leads to changes in global human functionality, all the way from physical and mental health and performance to the skills of stress and emotion regulation, awareness, mindfulness, and metacognition to the deepest experiences of positive behavior, well-being, values, life purpose and meaning, and what we might call pure spirituality. So this really gives us an understanding of how this has relevance uh, to many different populations and perhaps even many different uh, medical disorders. And, and clearly uh, the role of stress and emotion regulation, uh, the increase in mindfulness, um, the increase in physical health, because we know that many mental health conditions have physical components. There's an enormous amount of relevance here for mental health and wellness. So let's take a look at yoga specifically for wellness. And um, there are reviews that certainly tell us that, that quality of life is improved with yoga interventions. Um, this is a study uh, that showed that meditation and yoga is positively associated with mental health. Length of lifetime yoga practice was significantly associated with better physical health, suggesting yoga has a potential cumulative benefit over time. And um, this review here, looking at modern postural yoga as a mental health promoting tool, they concluded that most studies observed ameliorations in uh, positive mental health indicators due to yoga practice. And then this systematic review that we just published on yoga for um, uh, child and adolescent populations, the outcomes in these studies included a range of constructs in three domains, psychological, behavioral, cognitive, and physiological, physical functioning. In all but five studies, yoga improved outcomes in at least one of these three domains. Results indicate growing evidence that yoga is a promising intervention for children and youth. And uh, finally, this um, study in, in uh, another review um, showing that uh, in older adults, yoga is associated with improvements in health rated quality of life and, and mental well being among older adults. Just to show you an example from our research of one area in which wellness is improved, we're, we've done a number of studies looking at burnout and professional uh, workplace populations, and one of the subpopulations we've looked at has been healthcare workers. This is a big issue in the field of modern healthcare. Um, this is from a recent review. The prevalence of physician burnout has reached critical levels. Recent evidence indicates that nearly half of all physicians experience burnout in some form, and it appears to be getting worse. In the US, on average, one, more than one uh, suicide occurs uh, per day uh, for physicians uh, in this country. Now there is evidence and growing evidence that yoga is serving as a tool for managing stress and burnout, uh, as evidenced by the systematic review in which they concluded that yoga appears to be effective in the management of stress in healthcare workers. 
Um, and we've used this program called RISE, developed by the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health for insertion into the workplace uh, for high stress oc uh, occupations such as first responders and health and human services. And one of the studies we did was actually done at Brigham Women's Hospital, a Harvard affiliated hospital in Harvard Physicians. This was a six week intervention delivered at the hospital. Um, these individuals were practicing yoga um, and we saw changes, statistically significant reductions by the six week um, end of intervention in total burnout scores on the professional fulfillment index, uh, and also saw improvements in subscales of work exhaustion, interpersonal disengagement, and professional fulfillment. We also saw improvements in perceived stress, uh, reductions, improvements in resilience to stress, and improvements in mindfulness. And in all of our studies, we're seeing this tight relationship between mindfulness, stress, and resilience. And, and I believe um, that the evidence is really starting to show that uh, mindfulness is one of the mechanisms underlying this improvement uh, in stress and resilience. We've also then uh, studied Harvard resident physicians who are even under more stress than the physicians themselves. And this was a randomized controlled trial. We showed reductions uh, in total burnout score and also improvements in the subscales of work exhaustion, well-being, and interpersonal disengagement. And like we saw in the physicians, we also saw improvements in perceived stress, resilience to stress, and also scores on mindfulness. Now turning to yoga for um, clinically significant mental health conditions, um, this has also now been an area of significant research. Uh, and this is a quick study I did on PubMed just to pull out those um, citations which have titles with the word review or meta-analysis, a mental health term referring to some kind of mental health condition, and the word yoga in the title. So this is a very conservative um, uh, survey of the number of meta-analyses and reviews. And you can see the enormous number of, um, uh, the enormous increase in the frequency of these reviews and meta-analyses. Um, uh, over the course of the past decade. So this is a booming area of research. And when we look at specifically the uh, PubMed search terms, which have these mental health terms in the title and the word yoga in the title, uh, we can get a sense of where most of this research has been done on what kind of topics. And what you can see is stress plays a huge, um, uh, yoga has a huge impact on stress and a lot of studies have been devoted to that. But then of course the two major uh, mental health conditions of depression and anxiety are leading. But we also have a growing number of studies looking at psychosis, um, and particularly schizophrenia studies. Um, some studies have looked at sleep. There's a growing body of research on the benefits of yoga for trauma and our lab has engaged in, in three studies in that. Uh, and there's also studies looking at eating disorders and addictive behavior. And we've summarized a lot of this in our, in our book, Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare. In the three chapters we have on depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions, this is all uh, extensively reviewed. Um, some reviews are showing this, uh, this effect as well. From this uh, review in 2013, our systematic review finds emerging scientific evidence to support a role for yoga in treating depression, sleep, sleep complaints consistent with both popular beliefs and biological studies, and having adjunctive value in schizophrenia and ADHD. Uh, more recent review in 2019, uh, yoga serves as a holistic practice and promotes an individual approach to healing that is acceptable and feasible for people with common mental health conditions. So I wanna just show you an example of our research, uh, which we have done on uh, anxiety related conditions. And we start, and this, there are reviews that summarize this work as well. This is uh, led by my colleague Stefan Hoffman at Boston University. Uh, this review in 2016, where they concluded Hatha Yoga is a promising method for treating anxiety. Um, and this more recent review in 2018 by Kramer and colleagues, a meta analysis uh, showing that um, uh, on a forest plot through their meta analysis, that um, the studies have favored yoga as an intervention uh, in the treatment of anxiety. We started work uh, looking at music performance anxiety in young adult musicians and found that indeed uh, in solo music performance anxiety, we had statistically significant reductions in music performance anxiety. Uh, and this is a significant social anxiety condition in these performers because if they can't uh, get on top of their performance anxiety, they, they can't really have a career uh, in music. 
Um, we saw the same benefits in adolescents as well. Um, and these were done at the Tanglewood Music Center in Western Massachusetts. Again, a six week yoga intervention was able to reduce music performance anxiety um, uh, significantly compared to the controls in this study that did not practice the yoga. We then moved on from um, music performance anxiety to a couple of very uh, small studies that looked at generalized anxiety disorder. And what we found um, was that um, we saw uh, clinically and statistically significant reductions in the number of metrics in anxiety on the Beck Anxiety Inventory, the SCL90R, and the State Trade Anxiety Index all showed uh, strong effect sizes with, with the yoga intervention we used. Another study that we did combined cognitive behavioral therapy together with yoga. And again, we saw statistically and clinically significant improvements in state and trade anxiety and also in panic scores. We used these pilot data to apply for a grant to our National Institutes of Health, and we were fortunate enough to get funded for a multi-site uh, randomized controlled trial uh, for yoga for generalized anxiety disorder. This was a three-arm trial that compared Kundalini Yoga versus cognitive behavioral therapy and a stress education control condition. Uh, these were compared with non-inferiority tests uh, and uh, compared to st stress education and superiority tests. The total sample size was 230. These were all subjects with a bona fide DSM-5 diagnosis of GAD. Uh, the sites that we used were Boston University and Massachusetts General Hospital. The two active interventions had sample sizes of 95, and, and the control condition had a sample size of 40. Uh, we had two instructors in group, for, in group uh, therapy formats over 12 weekly two-hour sessions, and participants did a daily homework practice of 20 minutes of each of the interventions they were assigned to. There was intensive treatment integrity and compliance monitoring. The outcomes were evaluated bi-weekly at end treatment and at a six-month follow-up. Um, secondary aims and analyses, some of which are still under, underway, included mediators, moderators, and an evaluation of some degree of mechanism. And just to share the bottom line, this is the response rate in terms of those that have recovered from GAD. Um, and what you can see is CBT is really superior uh, in terms of its uh, uh, trajectory, uh, having the highest level at the 12-week end uh, treatment and at the six-month follow-up. Um, but the yoga intervention is also encouragingly strong, not as strong as CBT um, at either of these time points, but it was stronger the stress education at the 12-week uh, end treatment. So we were really encouraged by this. This is the first real significant trial of yoga for generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, and compared to CBT, which has been modified and, and tuned up for the past uh, several decades, um, it's really encouraging to see this strong of an effect of a yoga intervention on its first uh, significant trial. And we're hoping that, um, you know, publications like this in the strong journal that it's in, JAMA Psychiatry, uh, will really uh, raise uh, some awareness of the potential of yoga for the treatment of mental health conditions such as uh, GAD. So I'm acknowledging the uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which funded that trial and a number of my early research study, uh, studies. Um, I also work with the International Association of Yoga Therapists, um, which accredits uh, yoga therapy schools and certifies yoga therapists. They host the International Journal of Yoga Therapy, of which I'm the editor-in-chief, and I also coordinate the annual symposium on yoga research. Um, and that symposium is occurring in mid-November. For those that are interested, this is a bona fide, solid research um, uh, symposium. We have leading researchers in the field presenting um, oral presentations as well as poster sessions. Um, this year, it's entirely online. Uh, I'm also acknowledging the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, which funded a lot of those studies uh, that I showed you on yoga in the workplace. Um, and I'm also funded in part by the Kundalini Research Institute, which supports the style of yoga I practice. And I also work with the Yoga Alliance as their director of yoga research. And my goal there is yoga research literacy. So uh, what we have on the Yoga Alliance website is a set of yoga research videos professionally produced talking about the research evidence on yoga for multiple different conditions. We have over 30 webinars that we've done on the research evidence for yoga in different conditions and different populations. And I also curate a whole collection of reprint uh, citations um, on their website in, in a variety of different um, uh, fields within basic research, special population, and different diseases and disorders. 
Um, so I thank you for your attention and I'm closing with this image of inlaid marble, which is an uh, image of a yogi, uh, which happens to be embedded in the um, temple, at, in the Golden Temple in Amritsar in India. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that uh, you have.